Good morning. Today, Glenn McRae will share the message from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. I'll read in Mandarin, and Lauren will read in English. Hear the word of the Lord. Bang Wang Tian Liang Shi Fu Fu Uren Ting Jian Yeho Hua Shang Di Zai Yuan Zong Xing Zhou the Sheng Ying Jiu Tang Zai Yuan Zi the Shu Kong Zong Shang Do Kai Yeho Hua Shang Di Yeho Hua Shang Di Hu Huan Nao Ren Shuo Ni Zai Na Li they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man of his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord called, God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? This, this is the, the word, word of, of the Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Rainier Avenue Church. It's uh, such a blessing to be uh, in this space with you all. Um, I have to admit that I'm, uh, uh, whenever I've been in this space, I'm used to seeing people in it. And during the time of worship, um, uh, what came upon me was like how much I miss being in worship spaces. And I can't remember the last time we were in a sanctuary, um, but to be in this space with you all have been, has been a blessing to me um, already this morning. Um, I have to also thank you all because you all have been a congregation that my wife and I, our family, have uh, frequented over uh, the pandemic. And so I thank you for uh, being our church family online. Um, I hope that this morning's message uh, will um, be a continuation of, I think, the journey that, that Rainier Avenue Church is on, especially as you all and we uh, together would transition into this new year. Uh, before I get into some of that, I have to, um, a non-negotiable Pastor Peter shared was I have to share some photos of Nia. And so um, uh, this, is, this is our daughter Nia. Um, and I have to say, like, even minus the non-negotiable, I was going to show some of these pictures anyway as a proud daddy. But this is, uh, this is our daughter Nia Mariko Kealohalani is how you pronounce her name, I think. I think I sometimes mispronounce it. But... Um, my wife and I, we, have, uh, we represent multiple uh, ethnicities, and we're mixed-race individuals. And, and so what we really want to do is capture um, that essence. And so uh, Nia is Swahili for purpose. It's also a Kwanzaa principle. Uh, Mariko is uh, Japanese, meaning truth. And Kealohilani is Hawaiian, meaning bright light of heaven. And so her full name translates to Mina, and you might have uh, saw the art piece in, in the background, but Purpose, Truth, Bright Light of Heaven is uh, the translation of Nia's name, and uh, she has more than lived into that uh, in her 16 months of life. Um, I think needless to say, the, the last year has been um, uh, a lot, uh, needless to say, but I think very much worth acknowledging uh, the two most frequently adjectives I've used to describe 2020 has, has been um, uh, exhausting and probably more, I probably more use the word weird. And um, I think it just continues to be that way in 2021. Um, and, and you'll remember uh, during the beginning of 2020, COVID-19 hit. And uh, I, like many of you, perhaps uh, thought that it wasn't going to last as long as it has. And and, uh, and then eventually, when we started getting settled into it, it impact, started to impact me a little differently. Um, and, then, and then we entered a season of what many have called COVID-1619 um, and the uprise of the civil and racial and social unrest that persists in our country. And then we transitioned into um, a season of just a very exhausting election year um, that I think culminated to where it is and, and, and then even had some transition again into 2021. And then during the Advent season, I found myself really wanting to flip the page. I'm not big of a, a, um, a New Year's resolution type person, but I was looking forward to turning the page only to when we did turn the page into 2021, we caught some 2020 residue, as was already mentioned, in, um, that happened earlier this week that we prayed for beautifully this morning. And, um, and it was a, a, a challenging year. I think to add salt to injury, uh, insult to injury, um, the, the, the Seahawks lost yesterday, too. Not to sound petty about <laughs> the season that we're in, but they lost yesterday. And um, I think that disappointed a lot of us. 
Um, and that's been a place, I think, for uh, all, like watching a, a sporting event for a lot of us during this season has been uh, a place of peace and a sanctuary. Um, I do hope that you, in, in, in as exhausting and weird as the last year or so have been, I, I hope that you did find some places uh, of refuge and, and sanctuary. I know a lot of us uh, needed those creative spaces where we are creating new things, um, we're learning how to cook, or we're doing art, um, and just needing those creative spaces where we can exercise some of the things that we're wrestling with. Uh, a lot of us paid more attention to our health. We started exercising more, going on hikes. Uh, we, bought my, we bought a bike that we found on OfferUp. We drove all the way up to Everett to go get it. Uh, we used it as an excuse to get out of the house and just take a little road trip. Um, a lot of us bought Pelotons, and uh, we chose to uh, just exercise and just consider our health in this season. And uh, uh, many of us, uh, myself included, uh, started binge-watching things. Um, we, we started uh, uh, streaming on Netflix and Amazon Prime and, and um, things like that, Disney Plus and um, Hulu and all that. We just started streaming and, and we started binge-watching some new shows, maybe some nostalgic shows from the 90s, and um, we, we just watched that. Uh, one of my uh, favorite pastimes actually is watching movies. I love movies. Um, I don't have a particular favorite movie, but I, I enjoy uh, certain genres of movies, such as uh, the, the plotless and the brainless action movies that are just nothing but action, like the John Wick uh, franchise. I'm a big fan of that. I'm also a big fan of comedies. My absolute number one favorite comedy is Coming to America with Eddie Murphy, uh, and so I, I uh, uh, enjoy comedies. Um, I'm, uh, I'm also not ashamed to admit that I've, I've watched a few rom-coms, um, yes, and, and, um, um, and, and since I think this is safe space, I, I, can, I, can, I can maybe admit that I've shed a few tears watching The Notebook, even. Um, thank you, Nene. <laughs> and, uh, and the, uh, but I love movies. Uh, I absolutely love movies. My, my wife would tell you something that gets on her nerves is I will spend time watching trailers uh, Netflix trailers, and, and I will spend the entire time that it maybe takes to watch a movie watching nothing but trailers. And my wife will eventually grab the remote, just pick a movie, and say, there we go. I know it's something that gets on her nerves, but again, I, I, I just, I love, I love movies. I think if I could title 2020, uh, that movie title would be called, Where is God? Where is God in that movie? Um... Something I hate about movies, however, is if or when I miss the beginning of it. And because if you, if you, if you only capture 2020 as a clip, you get a snapshot of, uh, and you, only, you miss kind of the historical context that maybe led up to that, and you miss the bigger picture of what God might be doing or might be up to. Um, but still, I would call 2020, where is God? Um, and the, I, I have to rewind a little bit to uh, the beginning of this Bible movie in Genesis because it gives us a little context. Uh, it gives us a little um, a bit about the characters and the, and the major players in it. And it might even offer, I believe, um, some, some direction on how it is that we might navigate this 2021 uh, season. And we found uh, that in the book of Genesis, the God asked this question, where are you? So again, in the movie title, 2020, Where is God? I believe God is asking this question, where are you? And my hope is that it would inform us and direct us as we um, uh, go on this journey. Uh, where are you, to me, is a very significant question because it's the first recorded question that God asks humanity. Um, it's also a very controversial question. And there's a lot of theological debate as to whether or not uh, the question God asks Adam and Eve actually exposes God's ignorance or God's a gap in God, right? Because if God was supposedly all-knowing, why would God have to ask a question, where are you? Shouldn't God already know where Adam and Eve are? Um, however, what's important to understand about the Hebraic tradition is that questions aren't always meant for the person being asked, the person asking the question. The person... The, it's, it's mostly meant for those being asked the question. And so I would argue that the question is not to expose God's ignorance. It's not meant to, for God to know where Adam and Eve are. The question is meant for Adam and Eve to, to evaluate, to be introspective, to reflect on where they are, particularly in relationship to God. 
And we're going to explore that in our time together this morning uh, from four perspectives. Um, one, where are you spiritually? Um, where are you mentally? Where are you emotionally? And where are you physically? Uh, we'll start with spiritually. Um, a lot of people would um, uh, suggest that in the, the book of Genesis, second chapter, I think it's the seventh verse, uh, God breathed into man as being as marking kind of that spiritual introduction to humanity. But I would uh, rewind just a little bit into Gen- Genesis 127, where it says God created humankind in his image. Uh, the word image is another one of those controversial words. Um, this has been uh, really a, a, an anchor text, especially for those of us who ascribe to the DEI theology the diversity, equity, and inclusion theology. This text is what we've used to justify why black and brown bodies are valuable and why we should not be extinct from this this world. Um, And so there's a lot of hope for the black and brown community around this text. Like God created humankind, especially black and brown people, in God's image. Um, However, we've perverted that text, and unfortunately the Bible has been used to oppress the BIPOC population uh, but this, again, this text has given us a lot of hope um, that we've held on to. So, um, however, there's another, there's another meaning for the word image um, I'd like to share with you. The, the Hebrew word for the word image is selem. Uh, selem. T-S-E-L-E-M. Um, it means shadow or attachment. And so the Hebraic understanding of the word image has less to do with skin, complexion, facial features, hair texture, although important, uh, it has more to do with your attachment uh, to God. And um, back in the day, they, um, if, uh, if, if someone were to say you look like somebody, what they were talking about is you, look, you, you acted like that person. So when they say you look like somebody, you were created in their image, what they meant usually was you did something that reminded them of somebody else. And so imagine the confusion, as was shared, I think, beautifully this morning in the prayer, was like, imagine being a person that said, like, you know God, right? And then you end up not teaching or not um, showing or not treating other people what that looks like. Like, I know God, but I'm I'm going to treat you differently, or I'm going to undermine you, I'm going to oppress you. There's a disconnection there for a lot of us Uh, But again, the reminder is that we were created to be attached to God. I think some questions to reflect on here um, as you wrestle with this are these. Are you feeling attached to or detached from God? How or where are you reflecting God to others? And how or where is God being reflected uh, to you? And I would argue, again, like, even if you don't know God, um, even if, if you just, you are still created in God's image. I think that's the message there, right? It's like, even if you don't know God, you don't know who God is, if, if, if that's true for you, you were still created in the image of God. There's a lot of things that I did in my lifetime that caused my mom to say, Glenn, I did not raise you to be like that. But that did not keep me from being connected to my mother to being the son of my mother. And so there's a lot of things that I think that we do that might prevent us from really um, understanding what it means for us to be attached to God in that way. Um, And then for those of us who believe in God or claim to believe in God, I believe that we have to be better stewards of what that looks like. Uh, John Perkins says it like this, you don't give somebody um, dignity you affirm it, which seems to suggest to me that I cannot give you what is already yours. I cannot give you dignity. You are already made dignified because you are a creation of God. But unfortunately, again, we've lived in a culture and a society that sought to strip that away from, especially our BIPOC siblings. Uh, My wife, I think, is a good example of this. She befriended our uh, local neighborhood uh, barista, coffee shop owner, and um, who is not a believer, um, but in the conversation she had with her, she said, you remind me, the, the way you love this community reminds me of the way Jesus loves his people, right? Like, as a non-believer, my wife can dignify this person and said, it reminds me 
that you are connected, that you love this neighborhood in such a way that, that it just reminds me of Jesus' love. And I believe that that is true because she was created to be attached to God in the image of God, um, even as a non-believer in God. Secondly, um, where are you mentally? Where are you mentally? In the text, we, um, we see this exchange between the, the serpent and, uh, and Eve, and it, and it reads like this. Um, the serpent says, did God really say you shall not eat from the tree in the garden? Eve's response, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did, did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Then the serpent's response is, you will not certainly die, for God knows that when you eat from the garden, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so this question to me is like pretty profound, because as we mentioned earlier, where are you is the first question that God asks humanity. However, it's not the first question that was asked to humanity. This question of, did God really say, is the first question that is asked to uh, Adam and Eve. And I, I believe that exposes to us kind of the conflicting voices and the competing voices that we wrestle with. A lot of us, I think, wrestle with these questions without engaging God, and we entertain this for such a long time, and then eventually we start to engage God on the tail end of that. So it might sound like, did God really say? Did God really say I was created in the image of God? Or did, did God really say that God loves me? Did God really say that I was fearfully and wonderfully made? Did God really say these things about me? And then you start to kind of wrestle with it, and then eventually you might engage this conversation uh, with God. But again, I believe that there's competing voices that are um, wanting your attention, and those voices are going to distract you from hearing the voice of God and instructing you on the direction that you ought to be going. And I think that's particularly important in this season, especially of fasting, as you explore that. Um, and there's a, there's a major mental health crisis uh, in America, as we know. Um, I won't go through all of these uh, stats, but um, we'll leave it up for a moment, just so you can uh, kind of get a snapshot. I will highlight a few things, however. Um, I'll highlight the fact that uh, there's a 70% reported um, that the top, one of the top three contributing things to the mental health uh, concerns is loneliness and isolation. Um, I'll also share that uh, the black and brown communities, there's an there's a increase in um, reaching out and desiring mental health professionals and, and help and support. I think that's very important because that's um, typically and historically very taboo in black and brown communities, very understandably so. Um, but I think what's encouraging in that also is that there's uh, an increased number of black and brown mental health professionals that now the BIPOC community can feel a little safer in in processing some of the things that you're, they're experiencing. Um, young people continue to be among the most that are impacted um, in terms of mental health and um, suicide and, and those kind of ideations. Um, but again, there's a, there's a mental health crisis, I think, in America, and, and, and we're competing against these voices that are um, impacting our decisions. And so the question I believe to wrestle with is, is this. What voices do you need to turn down? What voices do you need to turn up? What voices do you need to turn on? And uh, what voices do you need to turn off? I think recognizing that there's a vast array of voices, uh, again, that are speaking into your life, that we're making decisions to listen to, and um, there's some voices that, quite frankly, we just need to turn off uh, because we've given it too much airtime, and uh, that's something that we need to consider. Uh, Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley suggests that there's six types of people that you need in your life. Uh, the first is a comforter. Uh, this person is there for you when you hurt, and he says this about a comforter. If you don't have a comforter, you will expect the person who hurts you to heal you. And so we all need a comforter in our lives. We need a, a confronter, uh, because guess what? You're not always right, and you need somebody to tell you when, when you're wrong or where you might be deviating 
from where it is that God might be calling and challenging you to. Uh, which thirdly, you need a challenger. Uh, someone who won't allow you to be satisfied with past progress. Fourthly, you need a counselor and uh, someone's wisdom who you can receive. Fourth, fifth, you need a co-benefactor. Um, you need to bless others because God has blessed you. I believe the challenge with this is sometimes as we're blessing people, um, we can get to a place where we expect a blessing back. And so sometimes we bless and we're like giving, 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 and then we're like, well, I'm owed something. I'm owed a blessing. And I would argue that we, our responsibility, especially as uh, beneficiaries of God's love and God's grace, is that we are responsible then to share that love with other people. And so you are already a benefactor, a beneficiary of God's love. And our responsibility, again, as believers, is how do we share and express this to other people? Um, and so you need those people in your life to um, share and bounce that uh, off and back and forth with. Um, lastly, you need a celebrator. Uh, you need someone who refuses to allow you to be depressed and refuses to allow you to be oblivious to God's goodness in your life. Uh, and so I would encourage you, as you're considering the voices that you're listening to in this season, that you would consider who these people are in your life. And I probably wouldn't put one person in all of these categories. Get you a team of folks, uh, because that's a lot of weight for any one person to carry but get you a team of folks that can really speak to your life and live into these six types of people that you might need. Next, uh, we'll explore kind of where are you emotionally? Where are you emotionally? In the exchange between God and Adam and Eve, uh, it looks like this. God says, where are you? Uh, Adam and Eve says, I heard the sound of you coming in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God then said, who told you you were naked? And we know that in this text, uh, Adam and Eve are perhaps feeling a sense of uh, guilt. They're perhaps feeling a sense of shame or maybe even embarrassment. Um, but something that really stood out to me in this exchange is, is, is a when Adam and Eve responded to God, it was related to their condition. And God did not seem to be as concerned about the condition as he was about the relationship with them. And that's evidenced by God actually going into that space that they were into. God actually pursues Adam and Eve, it seems. Um, and God seems to be more concerned about the relationship than he is about the condition. Um, and I believe some of our emotional state, we get stuck in this place of being more concerned about our condition. And sometimes that keeps us from having this very authentic and real encounter and experience with God. We are even more concerned about other people's condition and why they can't access God. And I would argue that God is not as concerned about your condition or other people's condition. God is most concerned about the relationship. And it, we hinder that, I believe, by being more, con more concerned about the condition rather than the relationship with God. I can't tell you the number of times that people have told me the reasons why they won't come to church or the reason why they won't come to faith is that they feel like they got to get themselves perfect before they actually do that. And that's the wrong position, I believe, because we ought to be in this thing as a community, uh, building and supporting each other up in this way. And, and to isolate yourself in that way is uh, damaging to, I think, your development in, in your faith. Um, and so I would, again, argue that um, um, where you are emotionally is connected to your condition and what you think about that. The question, I think, uh, to wrestle with is, again, is this, who told you you were naked? God's question to Adam and Eve. And what I mean by that is, what conditions are you emotionally wrestling with that is causing you to run or to hide from God? What conditions are you wrestling with emotionally that is causing you to run or to hide from God. For me personally, I'll admit, it's a, uh, I wrestle ongoingly about uh, in this felt sense of inadequacy, right? Not being good enough. And that has come from uh, the community and the context in which I grew up in. Uh, I felt like my life just did not matter. It just was not good enough. And that was evidenced by the over-policing that happened. Our school systems, although we have some pretty legit teachers, our school systems didn't support uh, our communities well. Um, and then the, the, the way we internalized that oppression and exercised it in our lives was um, 
uh, was ways that I kind of lived into that felt sense of inadequacy. So imagine when I came to faith, and now I'm wrestling with this felt sense of inadequacy, like I can't be good enough for God's love, right? I can't be good enough. I'm not good enough. How can God love me with all of my stuff, with all of these insecurities, with all of this baggage that I have? How can God love me? And it's one of those uh, unfathomable things for me to, to consider is God still loves us and God still pursues us as evidence in the garden. The last thing um, is where are you physically? Where are you physically? Uh, and this is the exchange between uh, God and, and, and humanity. Uh, the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And this is my beef with this, is in Genesis 126, God says, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over everything. Um, I put everything in there. It goes on to list a whole bunch of things, but in essence, it's, it's, it's everything. Uh, and dominion is probably more accurately interpreted as stewardship or um, a manager of of those things. And the reason why I'm, I, I beef with that is that Adam and Eve are hiding in the trees in the garden. And God earlier, a few chapters before, created uh, everything uh, so that Adam and Eve would have stewardship over it. Right? I, I want you to catch this. God created everything for humanity to have stewardship. However, Adam and Eve are hiding in the trees. Adam and Eve is hiding in a place that God is calling them originally to steward. And this is, I think, one of the blessings that the, the pandemic has, has, has allowed us and invited us to consider, right? The way that we can't participate in life the way that we did prior. We can't go out the way that we want to. Like, we have to isolate or we have to uh, sit in solitude. We have to quarantine, um, Right, and so there's 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 something that happens when 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 like we just have to consider how we're how we're stewarding these places that we're no longer able to to be a part of. I, I mean, a, a homes included, right? But my challenge to us, I think, the questions to wrestle with here is where are you hiding, and how might God be calling you to steward that place um, as you explore uh, and journey through 2020. Uh, if, you, if you have a question as to whether or not uh, God is calling you to steward something, um, it's probably that place that you're hiding in, right? And it's probably not uh, only a physical place. Maybe it's an idea. Maybe it's something that God put in your spirit um, to do this year or to, to have already done, uh, and then you're waiting for the safety and security of pre-pandemic in order to do it. Uh, you're hiding, right? Right? Like, and so the challenge is don't hide in that place, or while you're hiding, consider what it is that God might be calling you to steward while you're there, whether your home, whether your workplace, whether your communities and the ways that you serve, the way that you do church on Rainier and Juno, and the way that you do church in the Hillman City. How might you be hiding in the places that God originally calls you to steward? And that is, I think, a very significant challenge for us in this season as well. Wow. Um, I'll close with this. Um, the wherever you are, um, no matter where you are spiritually, no matter where you are mentally, no matter where you are uh, emotionally or physically, know that you were exactly where it is that you need to be. You were exactly where it is that you need to be. The gospel according to Arthur Ashe reads this. Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. And I believe that uh, God has really good stamina uh, because since the beginning, since Genesis, God had, God's been pursuing humanity. God's been pursuing us since Genesis. Um, and so if you're wondering where God is, I would encourage you to stop running, stop hiding, just pause for a moment, 
and consider where God is. And I've lived faith long enough and life long enough to know that as I look back and I reflect on my life, that God had always been there journeying with me. So no matter where you are, if you can't detect where God is, pay attention. And I venture to say, uh, and I submit to you that God's there with you. And you're exactly where you need to be. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you um, for this word, this question, where are you? And as we journey uh, with this, God, we pray that you would meet us, that this word would be a lamp unto our feet, a guide unto our path. And no matter where we are, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically, we pray that you would reveal yourself to us, that we would stop running and hiding. God, and that we would be reconnected to you. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name.